welcome you all to today's webinar. This is the uh, seventh webinar uh, this year that we have uh, actually arranged uh, on part of our association that is TESOL Society of Bangladesh. This is a new platform. Though we have started our uh, <coughs> activities from 2014, but uh, it was a bit slow in this year. I mean, we have launched a lot of uh, programs and this is the seventh webinar in this uh, year. And during the time of pandemic and all, I mean, uh, well, we have been switching to uh, online education and we have a few seminars on online education and teachers mental health and other I mean, topics. Today's webinar is on written corrective feedback on student writing. So without any delay, I welcome you all officially to our webinar on written corrective feedback on student writing. I will hand over to Sabrina Ahmed. Uh, she will be our moderator today and she will introduce the guests and will comments. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have Said Sir as well. Welcome, sir. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Saeed Ramasar is here. Please unmute, sir. Okay. No, unmute. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Saeed Rahman is actually the president of uh, TESOL Society of Bangladesh. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think you, you need to play your role as design. Uh, I just finished uh, a meeting almost like two hours, and I just uh, thought that I need to greet my international research person, the Ian McLeod and Ida, personally. That's why I just logged in to say hi. And if possible, I'll join at the later stage of the uh, workshop. Uh, uh, welcome uh, on my behalf. And uh, we are so glad that we, we got another international expert with us. Uh, TESOL Society of Bangladesh, uh, as, a, uh, as an association, we started in 2014. But very recently, we've been very active, and this is possibly the uh, we have this is the number seven webinar, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Sir. And we have uh, many more uh, coming. We already uh, started having number of uh, collaboration with international associations. Uh, there are a number of association uh, have been approached uh, to have the collaboration, especially research and academic uh, collaboration. We are exploring. And we also, uh, just today, the project that I've been working with uh, one of the leading uh, organization, it is about teacher training. So we have a number of avenues that we are doing at this moment in Bangladesh. And very soon will be the largest uh, teaching association possible in Bangladesh. That's what we are looking for. My special thanks uh, to uh, Dr. Sabrina Ahmed, my colleague, with whom actually uh, we are working together in a project. So uh, she took all the effort, all the initiative to connect with our experts today. Uh, Sabrina, thank you so much. And then uh, I'm thank sure you. that uh, you'll be uh, moderating the entire station. So with that, a small note from my end, uh, Atik, I'm, uh, please take over the way you were supposed to. I, I just <laughs> thought that I need to get in to give a moral boosting to my participants. And my committee, they love me so much. So I thought just to say you hi and hello and I'll become silent for some time. So please continue. Thank you so much. Uh, that was so kind of you, sir. We have already started. I think uh, we'll continue. Sabrina, okay. ma'am. Okay, so um, I, I welcome everyone um, to this webinar on uh, written uh, corrective feedback on student writing. And this will be presented by Ada McLeod and Ian McLeod. Um, uh, just briefly to talk about Ada, uh, she is uh, she is born in uh, Macedonia and she um, completed her undergraduate in English um, language and literature from University of Cyril and Methodius in Scopes and uh, she did her PhD um, in English philology from the same university. Um, currently, she is in Australia with her husband. Ian, and she is independent uh, researcher uh, there. And uh, also she has served as academic development coordinator of Ericon College School of Linguistics in Malaysia. And uh, served as associate professor of Department of Languages, Cultures and Communication in Southeast Europe University in Macedonia before. And uh, her um, 
research interests, recent research interests are critical thinking and inclusive education, and um, how we can make uh, disabled students uh, learning easier. Uh, so she has publications on um, this and also some conference paper presentations on these areas. Our second speaker, Ian McLeod, is an Australian uh, born in Brisbane. And he uh, is from the field of English studies, language and literature, comparative literature. And um, he graduated in uh, French and German language and literature and went to Oxford as the Queensland uh, Road Scholar for, uh, for 1973. So he completed his Oxford doctorate in comparative literature and was the founding, a founding editor of the Oxford Literary Review. He has taught at University of Oxford, um, Leipzig, Limerick, Brisbane, Dublin, North Macedonia, Kuala Lumpur and Brussels. And uh, in these places, he served as the professor of English at the uh, Institute Liber um, Marie Hebs, a school of translation and um, inter interpretership. Okay, so um, he also served as the vice president of Belgian Association of Anglists, Anglicists in Higher Education and contributor of the literary encyclopedia. So if I um, uh, keep on, keep going on with the bio, maybe uh, you know, like we will lose time. So without uh, losing any more minutes, uh, let's um, begin the webinar. So I welcome Ada, who is my friend, and we met in a Turkey Turkey conference uh, nine years back, and we just clicked. And all these years, we communicated through email and perhaps Facebook, and suddenly Ada is saying that, okay, I'm getting married to an Australian guy. And uh, we were very excited. Like suddenly um, uh, she has decided because she was not willing to get married to any, uh, any kind of guy. So this person has to be very special to be uh, getting married to. So uh, four of us um, in Turkey conference we met, and uh, we are still in contact. And I'm very happy that we are collaborating in this manner after nine years of our first meeting. Um, so, okay, so uh, let's begin our uh, webinar. I'll um, give the floor to Ada and Ian. You can share your screen. Thank you, Sabrina. That was a very generous introduction. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. I hope you can see it. Can you see the slides? Yes. Yes, we can see the slides. Please continue. Okay, excellent. So, let me just. So, thank you for joining us, joining us today. And the slides. Please unmute your microphone. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes, we can hear okay, you. Excellent. Yeah. So thanks for joining us once again. And this is where we are at right now in the state of Queensland. <laughs> No. Okay, so here are some pre-webinar questions for you to think about and please send your comments via the chat function in the Zoom. So what activities do you do in your classes to give students feedback? How much feedback do you give to students? When and how do you correct their errors? How much do you think your students' writing improves due to the feedback given by you? So please write your comments and we will look at those later on, okay?
Generally, I have found that it's a bit of a struggle to bring the students to a point where they no longer make language mistakes in their written English. And all through my English teaching career, which comes to 25 years now, no matter how well I taught the students to use the macro level language devices and cohesive structures, bridges and linkages and connectives, the students would still repeat the same language mistakes, like grammar, spelling, punctuation. And uh, that's how we became interested with Ian in doing research to find out which error correction strategies would have the most impact on the quality of my early uh, secondary students' written production in English. So we wanted to find new ways to give feedback to students and to see what the latest research on written corrective feedback is suggesting. And here are the notes on the focus of the workshop. So first, I will give an overview of the research that has been done on WCF. Then I will show you how this worked in practice and what's next. So I want to open the discussion by offering a number of questions about written corrective feedback and the research record on the use of corrective strategies in the teaching of writing. So these questions are meant to be testable and discussable and to give structure to our webinar. So the first one is, what is the priority in teaching writing? What is the most important thing? Accuracy in writing is highly important. It is the most important skill we can ever teach any child because in the world beyond the school gates, inaccurate writing is highly stigmatizing and disabling. And many scholars believe that accuracy in writing is different from accuracy in speaking. You would not want to correct students on every mistake they make while speaking because that would interrupt their thinking. So going after accuracy in writing is a different story because of the different time relations around writing and it can be sought in a more relentless way. So teaching students to write correct English is basic and thus arguably have a high priority. But it cannot be fully accomplished first off as a completed first stage in their learning after which they can calmly move on to acquire the other dimensions of good writing. No, writing is an organic unity. This means that the proverbial horse and cart have to swap places continually in the cycle of teaching and learning. And this means sometimes the grammar accuracy supports, underpins the good writing while at other times the errors in the writing serve as occasions for learning language accuracy. For example, when a pattern of errors shows up in a piece of writing, well, that's the trigger or the signal for the teacher to insert a mini grammar lesson on that particular error topic into the class. Next is manageability. So pragmatically and logistically, there is no way for a teacher to correct all the errors in all the written work of all the students. So what ways exist and have been tried to make written corrective feedback manageable for the teacher and not overwhelming for the learner? Next is responsibility. In any case, it's not the job of the teacher to rewrite the student's text completely removing or repairing all its faults. That would be the job of a proofreader or copy editor, which the teacher is not. So the teacher has to teach the students how to do it themselves, getting them to take the responsibility themselves for the quality and accuracy of their written English. And in this case, I provide students with many lessons to follow up the corrections of their own mistakes. Furthermore, even if time permitted us to do a full 
stale teacher written corrective feedback, it would not be educationally right and proper because it keeps the student dependent on the teacher. Whereas the teacher's aim must be to make the learner independent and autonomous for the very good reason that these kids won't ever again have a teacher at their side to clean up their written English mistakes after they leave school. So we're going to look at some practical classroom strategies. And here is also something for you to think about, like what practical classroom strategies and what feedback tools do you have at your uh, disposal other than writing by hand in the margins of the student's work. Okay, this is something for you to comment on the Zoom via chat box, please. So I will start with the first part, which is chronology of the research on written corrective feedback. So as a research topic, written corrective feedback has a long and interesting history. It has been very much like a, like a tug of war. When you open just about any of the hundreds of research papers, articles and dissertations of written corrective feedback, you will usually find yet another summary of the scholarly debates around written corrective feedback since the 1970s. And a good example of the scholarly debates around WCF or written corrective feedback since the 1970s is found in Shelley, 2014. So he says, questions and theories regarding corrective feedback in English as a second language, writing, have long been considered. Truscott put a spotlight and a microscope on this area of research when he posted that what were later criticized as rather rash and absolute statements regarding corrective feedback. Truscott put himself out on a limb when he stated that the consistent failure of grammar correction probably cannot be attributed to any particular form of instruction. After reviewing the research studies done by Kepner, Semke and Shepard, Truscott arrived at the overall conclusion that teachers can best help students by abandoning grammar correction. Is there a way of making that go away because you can't see the whole slide? Technical. Yeah, I, I don't think it can be done. Okay, carry on. So, today I would like to pick out four or five key moments from this long history because some of them still have salience and relevance for classroom practice today. In all of the scholarly literature that I consulted, I found no consensus about written corrective feedback. This lack of consensus in the research and the practice of written corrective feedback affects not just the operational questions of what type of corrective feedback to give, how often, how much, etc., but even the essential issue of whether the giving of written corrective feedback helps or harms the learners and the learning. John Truscott said the following, grammar correction in second language writing classes should be abandoned for the following reasons. A, substantial research shows it to be ineffective and now shows it to be helpful in any interesting sense. B, for both theoretical and practical reasons, one can expect it to be ineffective and C, it has harmful effects. So Truscott's argument surprised me. Then we have Dana Ferris, who responded at conferences and academic seminars over the following year, and in 1999 published counter-arguments to Truscott's article, which stirred up further debate. So John Truscott's 
1996 language learning article, the case against grammar correction in second language writing classes has led to a great deal of discussion and even some controversy about the best way to approach issues of accuracy and error correction in ESL composition. So this article evaluates Truscott's arguments by discussing points of agreement and disagreement which his claims and by examining the research evidence he uses to support his conclusion. So the paper concludes that Truscott's thesis that grammar correction has no place in writing courses and should be abandoned is premature and overly strong and discusses areas for further research. Truscott fired back immediately. Ferris, 1999, rejects my case against grammar correction in L2 writing classes, so I quote from Truscott now, and attempts to build her own case for the practice. This paper responds to her criticisms. I argue that these criticisms are both unfound and highly selective, leaving large portions of my case unchallenged, and in some cases even strengthening them. If the case for correction has any appeal, it rests on a strong bias that critics must prove beyond any doubt that correction is never a good idea, while supporters need only show that uncertainty remains. Ferris's 2012 book, sorry, then in 2004, Ferris responded by issuing this res resounding and thunderous general denunciation of all the research in the era, including her own. This quote from Ferris, despite the published debate and several decades of research activity in this area, we are virtually at square one, as the existing research base is incomplete and inconsistent and it would probably be premature to formulate any conclusions about this topic. Thus, findings from previous research on this controversial yet ubiquitous pedagogical issue are recast as predictions about what future research might discover rather than conclusions about what the previous research shows us. And then Ferris's 2012 book, jointly authored with John Bichener, Written Corrective Feedback in Second Language Acquisition and Writing, summarized and commented upon a large volume of research literature and proposed a wide array of pedagogical suggestions for practitioners. The controversy about written corrective feedback continues to this day. Both fairies and Truscott have published new research on WCF in the last half year. Since 2012, research activity on written corrective feedback has continued to sprout and swell, which makes it clear that the issues are not settled at all and the discussions continue. So in her new article published in November 2019, jointly written with Catherine Evans, Ferris continues to conclude in favor of the value of written corrective feedback. Results from this study indicate that careful scaffolding throughout an assignment together with well-timed and well-orchestrated feedback can make for a successful revision experience that capitalizes on multiple sources of feedback and provides opportunities for fruitful self-reflection and useful interaction between feedback sources. So what would John Truscott, Truscott say? Well, he has never abandoned his position. And then in May 2012, for example, 2020. 2020, sorry, he published a stinging critique of meta-analytic meta studies on this question, concluding, if he, we want to know whether correction is helpful for revision of the work on which it is given, or if it sometimes gives learner, learners intellectual knowledge of the language, or if it helps them pass formal gra grammar tests, 
then the answer is probably yes. But in regard to the central pedagogical question, does correction help learners develop the ability to use the language correctly in practical ways? Meta-analytic reviews offer no reason to think the answer is yes and considerable reason to think it is no. So as Ferris politely, politely put it, in 2012, the, converse, the conversation is continuing. And in 2020, this remains the case. There is a good deal more to say about how written corrective feedback can and should be implemented in writing classes and about ways in which the limited and somewhat flawed research base can and should be improved in the future. But what we have examined in this chapter at minimum supports continuing the conversation. So I find, we found that John Truscott's argument is very persuasive and intellectually irrefutable. So we can sum up his position like this, and this is our own summary. No research has proved that WCF helps learners acquire linguistic procedural competence as opposed to declarative knowledge of the language. I don't have to prove that it doesn't, and in any case, you can't prove a negative. So the onus is on the advocates of written corrective feedback to prove the positive that it does help. After 24 years of further research, we are still waiting for that proof. Perhaps surprisingly, Ferris and Bichener don't really disagree with Truscott on this point. Their whole book is peppered with 57 repetitions of the admission that the research is inconclusive and further research is required. So their claim in the end becomes a modest one. So you can see from this quote. So the question remains what to do. Should we do what the student demand, as Ferris argued, or should we follow John Truscott's uh, advice? So Truscott went on to argue that it is teachers' real responsibility to, to help learners adjust to its absence. To sharpen up the discussion, let me now quote from John Bichener, who writes in chapter one of his joint publication with Ferris. The more important and controversial issue is whether declarative knowledge can be converted into procedural knowledge in the second language learning context. This has been keenly debated over the years before. If the former cannot be converted into the latter, which is the ultimate goal of SLA, second language acquisition, then the role of instruction and corrective feedback is brought into question. A crucial background assumption underlying all of the thinking of the pro WCF camp, Ferris Bichener, Robert de Kaiser, and even Hudson is that declarative knowledge has to be acquired and remembered before procedural knowledge can be acquired. And after 15 years, Anderson appears to have visited this position and he states, with very little and often no deliberate instruction, children by the time they reach a 10 have accomplished implicitly what generation of PhD linguists have not accomplished explicitly. They have internalized all the major rules of a language. So in other words, Anderson no longer sees language acquisition as an instance of the conversation, of the conversion of declarative into procedural knowledge. And this re revised view is indeed much more compatible with Michael Parody's survey of the neuropsychological basis for the dis dissociation of implicit procedural and explicit declarative knowledge. So, 
Question for all, is the Kaiser right or wrong? Can you really not have good procedural knowledge unless you first have declarative knowledge? But then how does any child acquire procedural competence of her or his mother tongue? And why from a cognitive neuroscience perspective would second language acquisition be so radically different from first language acquisition? So colleagues, please write in the Zoom chat space. What are your experiences of this? What are your thoughts, please? There is a reference to this abandoned distinction in the article on dynamic WCF by Hudson et al, 2010, of which, of which more later. So the Kaiser asserts that declarative knowledge, what one knows is required for the development of procedural knowledge, what one can do, and that it must be based on explicit rules and numeral numerous examples. He also claims that proceduralization requires extensive and deliberate practice, which then leads the learner toward greater automatization. Although such notions appear to be highly relevant for informing how WCF might be utilized, it seems that generally they have not been applied effectively in pedagogy. So that last mild manner sentence from James Hudson of Bryman Young University rang true to me when I first read it. However, many writers on WCF and its role on, in SLA, including Robert de Kaiser, appear not to have noticed that psycholinguistics and cognitive science have decisively shifted away from believing in the declarative procedural dichotomy. Hudson claims that if the Kaiser is right, and it's quite a big if, the problem with the failures of WCF to solve the problem of bad student writing is simply that there has never been enough extensive and deliberate practice given to students. The Hudson solution then is to give systematic frequent short writing tasks followed by systematic frequent bursts of written corrective feedback. But of course, if the Kaiser is wrong, as the trust code position asserts, then Hudson too is wasting his time. Easy. Now, in order to fill this gap in students' competence, because they were being given instruction only in the rhetorical dimension of writing, I gave them each day a mini lesson in grammar with repeated practice. And uh, this is in line with Ferris's recommendation. Now, quote, quote from their article, instruction can only be provided in groups of learners who show as a result of written CF that they are producing the same types of errors as other learners in their writing. For example, the teacher may provide a mini lesson on the use of the simple past tense to those whose written text contains errors in the use of the linguistic form. Now, let, let, let us move to the practical section, illustration of one type of WCF. So before I explain the practical classroom strategies, let me briefly ex explain another debate which scholars have had on the best type of error correction form comprehensive versus selective, direct versus indirect, error codes versus bare, highlighting or underlying. According to Ellis, comprehensive WCF corrects all errors every time. Direct WCF comprises both error correction and reformulation. In other words, the teacher rewrites correcting the student's errors. What is meant by focused WCF versus unfocused WCF? 
In contrast to focus CF studies, unfocused CF studies have not targeted a particular set of linguistic features in the CF provided. So focus WCF is intensive, whereas unfocused WCF is extensive. So here is table. And Alice, Alice notes that a basic distinction needs to be made between the option involved in the teacher's provision of corrective feedback and the student's response to this feedback. Clearly, corrective feedback can only have an impact if students attend to it. Thus, any account of corrective feedback must consider both aspects. Ferris, by the way, argues that selective WCF is in general preferable to comprehensive WCF and that indirect WCF is better than direct WCF. There are many different versions of error codes out there and many of them are very similar to and overlapping with each other having only minor or superficial differences. Some are long and complicated. I have had good results using Ken Lackman's code table at one time. And then I worked with David O'Regan's system. And one of the best systems that I have found is the one described by Zema and Rumishek which involves their own error code table and error logs, but ultimately I have adopted the code table proposed by James Hudson et al. for their dynamic WCF pedagogy. It is the shortest and the simplest to understand and use, which counts for a lot if you want second language learners to work effectively with it. Its other important advantage is that is integral to the dynamic WCF pedagogy, which solves some of the problems of full-scale comprehensive teacher written corrective feedback, especially the problem of unmanageability. And here is the Hudson error code table, first presented on page 74 of his 2008 PhD dissertation. And because I work online with digital resources and digital student responses to worksheets and task documents, I adapted Hudson's dynamic WCF code table to replace the non-digital symbols with symbols available on a computer keyboard. So before I show you a practical example of students' work marked up with the uh, error codes, let me know that I'm using pseudonyms in order to de-identify the students as the rules of learner confidentiality requires. I have found it convenient to get these pseudonyms from the random code generator software, and we have to protect students' identity and privacy. So let's move al along to look at a really short and simple practical example of a student's writing with the feedback that was given by the teacher using, at the time, the codes of David O'Regan from Kansas University. And this was a task given on the 4th of November, 2019, and the writing sample is student Uridan's answer to the final part, write your think aloud. So have a look for a minute, please. These are the instructions that I gave to the students, the ones that you see on the screen. And this is student Uridan, year seven student, written work sample answer to the final part. And this is annotation of teacher correction to sample student written. So the student then rewrote his short text correcting all the marked errors. Student Uridan shows quite advanced control 
of the verb tense system and how it articulates the time relation to the story. He uses the past perfect, had traveled in a correct relation to the past simple missed and wrote and the present perfect has written. Student Uridan is at the lower end of the ability range for grade seven and he has no reliable grasp of sentence breaks and spelling, issues which we might regard as more, more fundamental elementary than the verb system. He shows a pretty good control of punctuation. For example, setting the time parenthesis long ago between commas, but he fails to add the final full stop. And his use of the dash before I never wrote is arguably non-standard unless you regard it as a clever use of the dash to create suspense. So what's notable is that Uridan shows he has mastered the more advanced matters of verb tense usage and consistency, but still has hesitations and uncertainty about some simpler, more elementary points. Conclusion. This counts as evidence to support the regular use of teacher written corrective feedback, especially with regard to frequently given short form written tasks from students, because without it, neither the teacher nor the student would know which areas need attention. It is also evidence in favor of using the teacher written corrective feedback for the purpose of differentiating the instruction. Different individual students learn at differential rates and some, like Uridan, but not all, will have moved on to the more advanced issues without having fully achieved procedural control over big level matters like spelling and sentence breaks. So students typically are not aware of their own areas of weakness or lag in development and if no teacher WCF were being given, it's hard to see how they would ever address those areas of weakness. Now, questioning the assumptions, I think there is a good reason why Ferris was able to complain in 2004 and again in 2012 that even after decades of research on written CF, there was still no scientific certainty about its value. So it's because it's, it is impossible to prove a cause and effect relation between the WCF and any improvements in the quality and accuracy of a student's written English. Now, this is a sample of Uridan's writing done two weeks after the task we have just reviewed. And now, sorry, this is a sample from uh, Uridan's, Uridan's final assessment submitted two weeks after the first piece, which was returned on 6th of November, 2019. And the task was to write a story extension retelling part of the classic set text novel from a different character's point of view. Hence, this was new work, not a recast. And this result is interesting, firstly, because it does show some improvement. There are now no sentence break errors, like the one that the teacher had corrected in the example from two weeks earlier. Instead, Uridan has jointly has joined everything together in one overlong sentence using a lot of main clauses with conjunctions, seven times the conjunction end, plus one but and one so. There are no sentence break errors because there are no sentence breaks. It is all one sentence with 10 main clauses strung together. You could therefore say he has improved his grammar but not his writing. This is bad writing or bad style, but it's not bad grammar. Secondly, his previously evident prowess with a verb tense system has now collapsed. There are four correct uses of the past simple, followed by three wrong constructions of the present continuous, then a wrong present simple, which anyway should be a past simple. 
a correct present simple that also should be a past simple, like he can write instead of he was able to write. And finally, a clause with no verb, he very happy. Of the 10 verb constructions, only four are correct. So, note that the verb tense system had been a core topic in the grammar classes and Uridan did quite well in the grammar quizzes. How then can this sudden lapse of verb tense consistency be explained? I noted only that aside from the issue of verb tense consistency, his main problem was with past continuous construction. So I took Uridan aside for a one-on-one -on -one mini writing conference next day in class and gave him explanation, examples and practice in how to use the present and past simple of the auxiliary to have with the present participles to make the continuous tenses. So to sum up, this is at best a mixed result. And this is one of the harmful effects of WCF that Truscott warns us about. So Uridan was given negative WCF on sentence breaks. So in his subsequent work, he simply avoided all sentence breaks. His accuracy in spelling improved, followed a couple of WCF corrections, but his accuracy in verb constructions went all to pieces. Though he had been praised for his correct verbs and given no WCF on verb errors. In any case, the improved accuracy in spelling cannot be proved to be the result of the WCF that he was given. Another, one of the techniques we use this year, we try this peer feedback. So how do you teach students to do peer editing and self-editing using error codes to develop and practice metalinguistic awareness? So I started with a gentle whole class activity to raise awareness of errors. In other words, to get them paying attention and noticing when a sentence sounds or looks right or not quite right or just plain wrong. So let us turn to an example of how I used focus peer correction in whole class mode with anonymized samples presented in a PowerPoint slideshow. So the steps I followed are these. Please read these instructions. So the point is to get the students to acquire an, an ability to notice. And the habit of noticing the errors of their peers and along with that their own errors, but with an accompanying declarative knowledge. In other words, to gain a metalinguistic purchase on the accuracy or inaccuracies in their own writing. And this is a step in the direction of turning them into autonomous self-editors, which they will have to be for the rest of their lives after leaving school. And here is a sample from the lesson with a focus peer correction in whole class mode with anonymized samples. And since the whole class work was done orally, which is often a more lively and effective way to maintain the focus of all students' attention and engagement, there was no capture of student response data. After all, students had had a go at correcting the sentences and explaining the relevant rule, students were shown the same sentences with the errors labeled with metalinguistic codes. And finally, based on the oral discussion and the slides with the errors marked up, students were asked to write down their version of the corrected sentences. And after that, they were shown the model answers on a slide so that once again, they could self-correct. Now, we will move on and talk a bit more about peer feedback. So peer feedback is rooted in several theoretical frameworks and this encompass among others, the 
process writing approach, the collaborative learning theory, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development and interaction and second language acquisition. According to Warshauer, the potential of collaborative learning within computer-mediated communication is related to Vygotsky's social constructivist approach. So Vygotsky claimed that the construction of knowledge is socially oriented and he believed that learning occurs through interaction with and within the environment in which these interactions take place and that cultural tools influence learning to a great extent. So one of Vygotsky's major concepts, ZPD, refers to the distance between the actual development level of a learner and the level of potential development under adult guidance or in collaboration with more capable peers. So, in conclusion, I would like to say that it cannot be too often reiterated nor too emphatically stated that all learners are individuals who come to the classroom with widely divergent social, historical, cultural, psychological backgrounds and baggage aims and agendas. It is solely to imagine that we as teachers can either meet all different student needs or succeed in research projects to deduce universal uniform average conclusions about how to teach. And this implies just as much to the present webinar as to all the hundreds of research publications about error correction. All I can do for you is what I have just done to tell you the story of what I have tried to do with my own uniquely idiosyncratic bunch of students and what resulted from it. That is all I have to say. Now, what do you all have to say? That is all. We'll, we will answer some of your questions shortly. Thank you very much for listening and for your kind attention. And here's the bibliography. Here is the bibliography. If you are interested in reading any of those, I can send it to you by email. And once okay, again, the, uh, stop sharing the screen. Yeah, so that we can okay. see each other. Yeah. Yes. Um, people are asking for the slides. They would like to have the slides because too much of information. So yes. uh, once you give uh, give us the slides, we can share with them. And you okay. had asked some questions um, that uh, you wanted to uh, hear from the participants, right? So we can have a look at the chat box now. Okay. Um, like you had asked how, how we correct our students, right? Correct, yes. So some of them are saying peer correction. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, symbols we do not use much in Bangladesh. Oh. Like the symbols, um, like corrective feedback, no. Error codes, we Error don't codes, use. Yes. We don't use much. Um, and we also have um, some questions for you. Let me just open the floor for the participants so that everyone can speak. Uh, please raise your hand if you have any question. Um, that will be easier for uh, us to follow and answer. Anyone has any question or something to add? Oh. There are a lot of comments and additional information. Uh, some, uh, one of the participants was asking, how do we uh, use this corrective feedback error codes on, online? How to use it online? Because now, now we are facing trouble to teach online. 
so their main concern is how to give correction through online platform if you can add something to that well i have started to use those codes and as i said you know i have uh, changed I have uh, changed them so that I can use it online. So I use error corrective uh, code, error codes for correction. And all feedback is going to be computer mediated in the future. There will be no more bits of paper that you could scribble on in the margins. And the issue is really what level of detail uh, to provide the student with in the correction that you give. And there's a huge amount of research on that. And it's very hard to synthesize that down, to boil that down to a simple formula. Yes. But I think it is uncontroversial and pretty much unarguable to say that it's a bad idea to do all the students' work for them. And that is why it's useful to get the students understanding the meaning of the codes. Um, myself, I'm a great believer in codes. I see from a lot of the comments, oh, we don't use codes. The point of the codes in my experience is that it, it's a great way to develop metalinguistic awareness and to make students uh, reflective about their writing because without that they're really handicapped they really uh, can't improve very much in a in a short time if you just get them to be like little linguists with some understanding of different categories of errors that are common at their um, competence level or year level of study, then uh, they do the work for themselves and they feel better. Um, it goes, I found it goes through phases. Initially, students want a lot of spoon feeding and a lot of hand holding, and it's not good for them. And this, this really is Truscott's argument. If you haven't read Truscott's work on this, I uh, would highly recommend that you do so. It's quite freely available and all the references are in the bibliography at the end of the slides, which, um, you know, if you just, whoever writes to Aida and her address, she will send the, the package of slides uh, to you. Uh, just to finish that point, um, there's a... Uh, Can I ask you a question, madam? Yeah, sure. I am Rajaram Pal uh, English language teacher of a secondary level. Mixed level class is our reality. Uh, is there peer correction is enough for the students? Peer correction uh, is, you know, it helps them understand. In my case, they understood better the codes, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and it all, always should be followed with teachers' feedback, you know? Mm -hmm. Because on its own, um, and students don't know enough. Yes, they to, don't know enough, you know? They can't do everything. But it's... But they way like way. to hear from yeah, each yes. other. And it's, it's, it's very motivational, very motivating for them. But they like to work with each other, you know? And also, it makes them independent from the teacher. They do get a lot of ideas from each other and there can be a whole um, to and fro and... Uh, Rajaram uh, sir is asking when you have mixed ability students, it's a bit of... We do, yes. And what Aida does is to team up those with greater competence to help those with less competence. And Quite often, not all the time, quite often, the ones who are 
put in a position to critique and correct and comment on the work of the other ones feel a great sense of pride in doing so and it motivates them to um, do a better job, to learn a bit more, to go and check on things, to go and look up the grammar rules and examples. Uh, you know what helps? I have seen in some schools, uh, teachers use the same error codes throughout different year levels. So different teachers use the same error codes and then the t students get more used to them, you know? They're, they're, they are more consistent in what error codes they use and it helps students, you know, in the long run, they learn it easily. Actually, teacher is important here for giving feedback uh, in the uh, mixed ability classes. Oh, I would agree, certainly. Mm -hmm. but we have another question from uh, Imdad Hawk, yes. Sir, could you uh, introduce... Uh, Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is in and, and I'm a uh, ask your uh, question. Yes, I'm a secondary level teacher. Uh, I uh, teach uh, from grade six to get grade 10. So what uh -huh. I do actually, what I do actually, uh, first at first, I teach them the correction codes, the meaning of the correction code. And right. uh, I, sometimes I take uh, two or three classes to uh, make them understand what would be the meaning of this code. And yeah. then I, uh, uh, during this online uh, activity uh, this, in this pandemic situation, I also give them some writing tasks. And when they, uh, after their writing, they, took, uh, they take pictures and they send it to me. And then I use this cor correction code and I give back to, give all, the, uh, give all these things back to them. And uh, they try to find out their uh, own errors because if they can find their own error, uh, it will be, uh, it, the learning will be sustainable. So they try to find their own error and if they uh, find any challenges, they ask their peer because uh, it will be easy for them to talk about their errors with their peers. So they talk with their peers and then they uh, return me the corrected form of writing. And then I uh, give them the uh, Thank full you, and corrected that's version of it. Yes. Thank that you, sounds that's ideal. Thanks. Absolutely. So uh, can I just ask, have you done uh, analysis of results to so, sort uh, of measure the improvement yeah. after a certain amount of time? Yes. That uh, would be if I... When I when I go through the different types of uh, writings and uh, I, I found that okay this is the area they should uh, uh, they need support so I take a class extra class for that grammar grammar point or uh, that uh, about that lesson and then I give them the same task again and uh, it it gradually improves actually. Excellent. But uh, have you thought of doing a systematic? research project to evaluate the impact of this method on the quality of their writing. That yes. would be very good to see. Yes, yes. Uh, they really like this uh, type of uh, uh, my feedback because I'm not uh, uh, telling them you, you are wrong, you are not doing these things. Uh, this is not the way to uh, correct them. So I'm just uh, helping them. So, okay, try to find out the area, okay. And then I give them some uh, uh, example or give them an, uh, another uh, writing piece of writings so that they can compare uh, their writing with that, uh, that part and they can correct themselves actually. Well, this sounds like such excellent work. I really wish you would write a, a scholarly research paper on it. And maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but I can tell you there is a, a very large interest in the issues around written corrected feedback. I have seen so many articles, which are not very good, um, which are inconclusive, uh, you know, small scale and unconvincing in their findings. Um, if you haven't already done so, you should think about writing an article because your, your approach sounds wonderful to me. It sounds like you're getting great results. Yeah, and the world should know. Thank you, Ambassador.
Thank you. Uh, now <laughs> we we can look at other questions on the chat chat box. Uh, Mita Ghosh is asking. Um, how how can we um, correct elementary students so they don't really uh, understand much of the error codes elementary means you know like um, the simplified eight, set of codes yeah. so uh, how do you mm. suggest we can um, correct the errors especially online class in in online class and elementary students because uh, for peer reviewing also, they have to meet each other and be with each other, so that doesn't happen. Because they are smaller kids, um, it's difficult to get them to do that. Well, it's not something I've looked at, but um, thinking it through right now, um, it may be effective to adopt a sort of staged approach where at first, you just pick one or two common errors at elementary level and ignore all the rest. And you just have one or two codes that you use and you give plenty of practice with feedback on the results so that um, little by little, they acquire a sense of, you know, does the sentence look right? Does it look sort of right or does it is it just simply wrong? Um, this would be what the, the scholarship on WCF calls focused um, WCF. In other words, you don't try to do comprehensive, we're correcting everything, we have a list of you know 20 coded errors that they have to keep in mind. Little kids I'm sure you're right, uh, wouldn't be able to handle that. Um, so at that, and this is very interesting because at elementary level, like grade one, two, thereabouts, um, it would make a lot of sense, I'm sure, uh, to do focused as opposed to unfocused, comprehensive written corrective feedback. And uh, I don't know. Uh, Little kids that I've taught or had knowledge of the, the education of, um, they quite like graphical symbols. Um, I haven't done this myself, but it may be possible to devise little icons, sort of like emoticons representing just one or two language mistakes uh, common in that, at that level of writing and make it a bit of fun for the, the little ones. What do you think? Yes. Somebody yeah, should work on that. Work yeah. on that. <laughs> Simplify okay, uh, We have so some we other questions from yep. the audience. Yeah, maybe yeah. we can have a look at that. Um, Shoriful Islam Shorkar, he is asking what should be the priority of teaching uh, writing for the higher secondary learner? Grammatical accuracy or the content or the both or both. both. So higher secondary learner, that means the you know like about um, sixteen age, yeah, sixteen years of age in our country. Well after my view is that ten, if, sorry. After grade 10, uh, um, we have higher secondary level. That means, you know, like the board exam, they face board exam, yep. the government board exam they have to face. And then after that, they go to university or what you call college. So before yep. that, just entering before the university, we call it higher secondary uh, year. Yeah. This is something I've got experience of, quite a lot of experience, actually. And um, my answer would be that of course it all depends on the group and the student but in general if there are still what we call primitive errors elementary errors appearing in the work that really has to be attacked as a priority because that will destroy the credibility of any writing that they may come up with no matter how um, full of rich content or well-organized, well-structured, etc. Um, but 
it's quite likely in my experience that there won't be that kind of errors still prevalent in the work of uh, a learner who's uh, studied for 12 years, 10 years or 12 years, studied the language for that long. If there are still those errors, I think it has to be a priority to get them fixed. Otherwise, nothing else matters. I mean, if you have elementary errors still in your writing, nobody's going to take you seriously at university uh, or out in the world of work. So, uh, I mean, there is the opposite argument, of course. Maybe Aida would say something about that. You can have absolutely 100% perfectly grammatically correct English and it's meaningless. It can be just empty um, or disorganized. And there, in that case, the correctness doesn't matter. But again, that's, that's uh, rather unlikely to occur, it would seem to me, after so many years of organized and well-structured um, study following a, a curriculum with uh, you know step by step increase in uh, expectations and performance. And just one more thing, Sabrina. In my experience, and also from uh, what I have read in research, you know, reading and writing they go together. So yeah. we always need to be you know mindful of what topics we choose, what we ask students to write about. So yes. whenever I've given, and I've seen research, when teachers give, you know, some meaningful reading, not just like some topic like, oh, what did you do during summer holidays, you know? To Silly make things. it so personal. Yeah. So the quality of writing will depend a lot on what reading they're doing, because sometimes they lack ideas, you know? They're yeah. not informed about the topic that they are asked to write about, you know? Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah. Uh, another question from the um, audience is uh, that uh, what does the research of WCF say about L2 context and L1 context? Because in Bangladesh it's L2. Yes. Well, there is a split in the thinking and you have two camps. One camp says uh, acquisition of a second language is fundamentally different um, cognitively from the way that an infant learns its mother tongue. There is another camp that says that's completely nonsensical and it's, it's exactly the same thing. Um, and the, the um, Truscott people are the ones that impress me the most in terms of research credibility. And they are the ones who say De Kaiser is wrong. Um, Anderson himself revised his own position and leans more towards the Truscott position, which says basically you learn a second language the same way you learn uh, first language, and a mother tongue, which is essentially unconsciously. You learn it by exposure, you learn it by reading a lot, listening a lot. Um, you don't have to have the acquisition of a structured set of grammar rules before you can learn a language. Whereas the other camp says the opposite. Um, it says that, say, adult learners or learners who come to a second language at age uh, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10, it's the other camp says that they can't learn unconsciously. They need to learn the rules first before they can do performance uh, uh, competence in the language. I don't really believe that. I think it's fairly clear from a lot of research that um, the uh, declarative knowledge does not need to precede the um, procedural. procedural knowledge. And you only achieve automatization, which is the goal. That is where you produce a correct sentence, spoken or written, without having to think, first of all, what is the rule? You know, that's 
when you've reached um, the full fluency. And that is not achieved by drill and practice by learning off grammar rules. So, well, yeah, what yeah. do you want to add? Uh, if, if you want to add anything, um, I have another question here on the chat box. Let me uh, say that first. Okay, students in the tertiary level prefer overall feedback. So they don't want to go for um, detailed error correction because they're, you know, adult students, you know, um, tertiary level. So um, what approach should be adopted? Um, well, you know, that's a, a very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A very oft repeated um, dispute or difference of opinion. Um, students tend to want the teacher to do everything and um, it, it doesn't really help them to do that. Um, and I think, how can I put this? There is an awful lot of softness has crept into pedagogy. And there's an awful lot more hand holding and spoon feeding and cosseting than there used to be in, well, can I call it the good old days? <laughs> um, it's not meant to be e easy. It's not meant to be effortless. It's not meant to be just uh, you don't have to do the work and there has to be a toughness. And I think, um, just to give an overall feedback. Oh yes. Very good. Well done. Little Johnny or Janie, a pat on the back, a pat on the head. Um, that doesn't help them. And if they want to not be subjected to the, um, indignities of having their language errors corrected. It's hard to see how they would ever come to write, you know, perfectly correct sentences. So, you know, this is another, I'm a great admirer of John Truscott and John Truscott says, you don't always have to do what the students demand because it's not always good for them. It doesn't help them to become independent and it certainly doesn't help the workload of a teacher. Uh, so to sum all that up, I'm just saying there should be more toughness than many teachers that I'm acquainted with are willing to apply. So correct their errors. They might not like it. It hurts their ego, but it does them good in the long run, even in the medium term. Um, let's uh, take some questions from the uh, audience because I was looking at the chat box till now. Uh, do you Very have good. any questions? Yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks Sabrina. Sabrina. Sabrina's very good at this stuff. Yes. <laughs> if you have any questions, please raise your hand and unmute yourself and introduce before asking questions. No one is asking any questions. Everyone is listening to you. Okay. Um, okay. Ada was saying um, that reading is important. What I see in my um, six-year-old son's case that um, he started to read English before Bangla. Bangla is our mother tongue. Yeah. Because she, he goes to English medium school, that is. But uh, most of the reading he learned from me because I used to sit with him, you know, like storybooks, and I used to read through. So that's how he learned. Now the problem is when uh, the school has started to teach him Bangla, he doesn't want to read. He doesn't want to go for the mother tongue. Or he doesn't want to even um, hold mother tongue, uh, you know, like um, oriented books. I don't know what, why it, it happens because um, maybe our alphabets are difficult to write. English alphabets are easier or perhaps he grabs, grasped English before. So he finds it difficult for, you know, like 
another language to accom accommodate. But he is fluent in speaking, just the reading case, uh, he is not uh, willing to go for Bangla. This is a very so, interesting um, problem. Yeah. Very so interesting I'm thinking problem. of the procedural knowledge and declarative knowledge as we were sh sharing. Uh, perhaps um, when we teach unconsciously, you know, like when we grab language unconsciously, automatically, it's easier for us to grasp. As in case of my son, it's just a story and, you know, like reading through and then he knows the alphabets, he knows the words and it's easier. But now I have to force him to read mother tongue. <laughs> mother tongue. This is a very interesting problem. And a lot of studies have been done on bilingual kids and the, the neuroscience of bilingualism. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting because I've heard from many people saying this, like my sister's daughter, she reads perfectly well in English. She's 11 years old, but she doesn't want to read books in native language. She just wants to read in English. Is there any, Clary, do you have insight into yeah. the reasons why, it just, it's not just the script, it must be some sense of identity or an identity struggle in your child? What do you think? Because language determines identity. And so what's going on with that? How does it seem to you? Because to me, uh, it may just be a question of age and in a year or two, you know, your, your script is beautiful. It's visually delightful and I would imagine that at a certain age that will, the, the love of the aesthetics of it will kick in. So, um, but can I just ask, uh, obviously you would like him to be at least bilingual, yeah? And not reject, <laughs> reject his mother tongue and be unwilling to write in, uh, in Bangla. Um, it may be just a case that patience is needed yes. and in the developmental cycle of his, his growth, he will come to feel empowered to have mastery of both. Now, I don't know that that will happen and uh, no one can make any promises, but that would be a nice result. I think there are lots of ways to encourage him to take an interest. And uh, I'm sure you've thought of that. Uh, if you are persistent, uh, I think you will, you, you can uh, one day soon have a, a bilingual child happy to write in, in both alphabets. What do you think? Uh, yes. what, what are some experiences with that? It could be a very vexing problem, actually. Same with there. Yeah. Uh, we don't have actually a Sabrina ma'am with. Uh, us right now. Maybe there is some internet problem or some other kind of problem. Oh, okay. She disappeared. Yeah, she actually disappeared. <laughs> well, uh, we can follow up the conversation, I suppose, privately in email at a later time. Is it nearly time to stop? What shall we do? Uh, yes. Achikura, you're the boss. You're in charge. <laughs> what should we do? Uh, no. Um, uh, would you like to take one or two more questions? Sure. Okay. Okay, then uh, there is a question that when learners, this is from Hari Kakri, I mean, he, uh, from Nepal. Uh, when learners do not realize the value of feedback provided them, how to make them realize oriented to the feedback? Are they this important? is the biggest problem. Yeah. yeah. This is the biggest problem. This is a very and it's question. unsolved. This is a question not answered. And I don't know, I've spent all my professional life giving wonderful, marvelous, comprehensive, profound, analytical, explanatory feedback to students on their writing mistakes. It is incredibly galling when uh, they come to do the, the recast and they've taken no notice at all. 
And you can shout at them, you can uh, put all kinds of I don't know, blame and shame and pressure on them. Um, it's actually one of the, I mean, the resistance to taking notice of feedback is the biggest problem with written corrective feedback. And I think we probably didn't uh, emphasize that enough in, in the, the, uh, the webinar. Um, I have not found a way around this other than you keep on trying. And uh, it, said that. yeah, the feedback is useless if it is not received. And so there is a danger. All our cleverness and high expertise is, is just wasted. And I've yet, if anyone has an answer to that, I would love to hear it because uh, yeah, you can explain to them, this is not all the students, of course. Oh, definitely but you not always all encounter students. some who are like this. They don't want to listen. Um, what is their problem? I don't know. Uh, do they think that they know the language better? Maybe some do, uh, better than you do. Uh, <laughs> Do they really not care about quality because standards in the world of social media communication are so loose? That's a, that's a possible, that's a hypothesis as well. Um, you know, I would associate this, uh, uh, can I say the failure of the feedback to arrive or the failure of the student to receive, it's, you know, two sides of the same coin. Um, I would associate that with uh, what I observe in the form of a weakening of respect for teaching and a weakening of discipline generally. And, you know, it's the kind of thing you can't really say anymore because you know, teaching has to be based only on emphasizing the positive and, you know, written corrective feedback in its essence has to be negative. You are telling the kid he's wrong. And I think it's probably a widespread social trend in the whole wide world that kids aren't used to thinking that they're wrong. And so they will be, they will resist correction. And the only way to help them is just to fight against that strongly enough until um, their fragile egos get a little bit stronger from the, the, the buffeting and they're able to improve without feeling that this was somehow a demolition of their character or their, you know, their self-esteem. What do you think, Aida? Yes. That's a that's a long-winded answer, but I think there's no short answer. It's a real problem. Yeah, definitely. I think Sabrina, ma'am, is back with us, ma'am. Hello, Sabrina. Can't see Sabrina. Anyway, that was a good question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was a really good question. All the questions were very good, really. Ah, I think you have a great group. You uh, have a great group. Yes. And Sabrina, ma'am, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear. Okay, we just took another you question in, in your absence. Uh, you can continue, please. No problem, yes, go ahead. And then, uh, we do we have uh, other questions from the audience? More I'm not questions? seeing any more questions right now, actually. Okay. okay. So, um, can we end, end uh, this session then? Yeah, we have actually used up our time. We have used uh, 90 minutes, so yes. it's up to you. Okay, so um, um, thank you, uh, Ada, and thank you, Ian, for your very informative session. Um, it, it will be very helpful for um, all the teachers.